Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to yet again another fantastic Indie Creator interview. It's your Cape Rear Cody, and we're keeping it geekly with our returning guest, Richard Fairgray. We're here to break down Haunted Hill Volume 1 launch party. Let's get it started. Uh, last time we had you on for this book was Interview 70. So much has changed. Interview 389 right now. Okay, so, okay, so 319 interviews ago. You've really grown. You have two. You got a beard now. I, yeah, that's well. I mean, the beard's sort of old. Like I'm, I'm back to having a beard as after like not having one for. I kind of I regrew it during Octopus because um, when that campaign was happening, I was like so bothered by like the idea of looking like the character from that book that I regrew the beard that I only have in like two chapters of that book, uh, and then people started telling me that I like suited better, and then people started like casually being like because you're much fatter now and the beard hides your chin situation. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, wow. I'm really, people are very, people are very nice to me. That's, I thought that's it was more of, of like a daddy vibe. I didn't know it was more like, Hey dog, hide that chin vibe. <laughs> Get that out of here. <laughs> so Richard, uh, I mean, just for anyone who is tuning in for the first time, legally blind, 3% vision in one eye, over 200 published titles. Starting at the age of seven, writing Ghost Ghost, I mean, you have Blastosaurus credited as New Zealand's highest selling comic. For a Man, decade. For yep. a decade. Yep. Wikipedia, you better get updated sometime soon. Uh, and we're here to talk about Haunted Hill Volume 1 coming to print through Kickstarter Volume 1, dude. How the hell have you been since the last time you've been on the show? It's been a weird time. Like, I've been traveling a lot. Um, I, I, you, you know how you get that Kickstarter money and you just, like, disappear? Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a workaholic, so I'm kind of like losing my mind because I, um, like last year I drew like, uh, it was 988 pages of, of comics. And this year I was like, I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to do like 500 maximum. Cause like that was hell. And then, uh, my friend was getting married in Australia and I was like, well, I better go to that. So then I had to dip out to Australia for a second. Then I was like, I'm going to be so close to New Zealand. I should go see my mom because she's never going to get on an airplane again. And so then I ended up spending like five weeks just not being able to like draw any comics. And that combined with like this being my second Kickstarter campaign and like all of the usual bullshit that comes up in life. I think I did it like a tally yesterday. I've drawn like 130 pages so far this year. Mm -hmm. And that for me sucks. So like it's, it's really, I've had like a really good time and everyone's like, oh good, you're relaxing. I'm like, no, I'm way more stressed than I've ever been. Also I've got a torn rotator cuff, so it hurts to draw now. It's great life. How have you been? So man, whew. I, I, I've been, I've been kind of like in a similar boat. I mean, cause I was going to ask you, cause like for me, it's, it's kind of working in a, in, in a weird way. You know, I've recently just acquired, you know, some, some new work that I've been doing from home and everything. And I, I, I feel that too. There's a lot of, you know, just like spending more time with the family, making sure I'm getting that time in uh, and a lot mm -hmm. of stuff piles up, but it feels like I'm hitting stuff with new, with new energy. Like I'm like revitalized and even though like you know i'm really like addicted to interviewing i love doing it I, I would do it every single day if i could but it's like one of those things like i shouldn't like when i like when i come back to shows i feel like i'm i'm so much more hungrier for it do you feel like that is the, the case for you when you get ready to actually start nailing out some of these panels yeah some like it it, it depends like the first page always takes a really long time like i'm i'm like just between you and me and you know the entire everyone world, watching <laughs> um, i i've never designed a character like never in my life. I figure out what the character looks like panel one, page one, and then just kind of go from there. Mm -hmm. um, I do not have the patience to like do turnarounds or any of that shit. Eva is the first character that like after page one, I started doing like some rough sketches of her face, but that was just because her face is fun to draw and I was at a bar waiting for someone. Um, but like, yeah, that page one always takes like a while. And sometimes I'll end up redrawing it three or four times. Um, I just kicked off my new book uh, last week, or uh, I guess on Saturday, and I'm just on page eight now of that. So, uh, like that one, like once I get into it, once I'm like in the weeds on it, I can be so laser focused and so obsessed that I can do the 20 hour days and feel good about it. But um, yeah, that beginning part, and then like when it's like three pages left of the entire book, I start grinding to a halt again because I'm terrified of what comes after. Yeah, yeah. We have a uh, Wesley Gift over on Facebook. I just backed it. Can't wait. Thank you for that backing, Wes. We always love to see that. So appreciate you joining us. Now, Haunted Hill is a really interesting ride. I mean, g give us a little bit more. You know, what is this about? 
So Haunted Hill is a surrealist soap opera about a 35-year-old sloppy dirtbag problematizing <laughs> her way through every moment of life. Um, basically, uh, I came up with a character who was like me and my friend Eva, if we went down a slide too fast together, became one person. Um, and it, it gave me a way to write stories set in Hollywood while I was stuck in Canada during the pandemic. And what was meant to be like a six page short has turned into so far 13 issues. Um, and this is the collected volume of the first six. So in this story, uh, her Uber driver cancels on her because, you know, she, her Ubers cancel on her a lot. And you'll get to know her as a character and understand why. Like you can just assume a low star rating. Uh, and she has no choice but to get a ride home with some people in their 20s. And when you get in the car with people in their 20s, drama happens. So what should be a 10 minute ride from like 3622 Beverly Boulevard to Whitley Heights uh, turns into an all night adventure because uh, she has to like, they have to go to a donut place and the couple has to break up and they pick up a homeless guy and they fight about the relevance of a homeless shelter themed nightclub. And they go to an abandoned trampoline park and they have to go see a guy perform stand-up comedy at a grocery store and there's aliens and there's ghosts and they have to break into someone's house because they made a sex tape of one of the members of the group. And like Eva is trying so hard to have a good time, <laughs> be young and be enthusiastic, but she's also just fucking tired. Yeah. Because it's like 9 p.m. for her, you know? And she's not and 40, also, but she's close, right? <laughs> right she's, yeah, she's 35. She's, she's the age that I was when I started this book. Um, I always do this. I'll start a book and I'll be like, I'm going to make the character my age. And then like I age and my character doesn't. I'm like, oh God, this is such a quick way to feel old. So a lot of people probably don't realize either, but you're a stand-up comedian. You're, you were a stand-up comedian for some time as well. Yes. Yes. Uh, for like through, like weirdly, like this gets talked about, about me all the time and it's because it's on my Wikipedia the truth that's is exactly where I was, found it too. <laughs> I was a stand-up comedian in high school and to make money in college. And I have not done stand-up comedy. Like, I think the last time that I did comedy on a stage was 2005. So 18 years ago. Um, and I have this notebook that is filled with, uh, with like jokes that I would use for stand-up that is labeled as not funny enough for Twitter. Because my approach to stand up <laughs> is like it's a war of attrition where I will make one very small joke and it's not it's technically funny. The goal is technically funny, right? And so I'll keep making these tiny jokes and then with each progressive joke, one more person in the audience will be laughing until eventually I've told you fifty jokes over the course of five minutes and suddenly everyone is laughing a lot because it, you just wear them down, you know? Uh, and that that doesn't work in real life. Well, humor is, is uh, it's a hard thing to do, you know, and stand up in particular, getting up in front of people and being able to, to, to nail out your set. Uh, that is for a lot of people like next to impossible. And you're doing this legally blind. I mean, let's not forget that in well, itself. Yeah. <laughs> but that just makes it easier because I'm not, I'm not scared of the audience because I can't see yeah. them. <laughs> Are you able to like picture them in their underwear? Like, how does that work? <laughs> I never understood the point of that. I'm like, it's okay not to get off topic but i've been thinking a bit about superman lately and you know everyone always does like the the joke of like superman can see uh like x-ray vision can see through people's clothes and it's like you know what's not appealing the idea of looking at somebody's naked body mushed up and held together by clothing like you're mm -hmm. looking at the weirdest wrinkled creased version of a person of, like imagine imagine being like i'm gonna check out that dude's dick but the dick is like tucked into some underwear and wrapped around in his balls and they're all held into this very perfect tight shape that's i thought that'd be animal. you're not into that i thought you'd be into that like that'd be something you're into no like like i'm saying i love seeing people in their <laughs> underwear don't get me wrong about that like, a, well, a well presented situation is great i shouldn't say situation that's the name of my dog um a well presented <laughs> package is, is wonderful but like the idea of seeing the actual nudity underneath the underwear that superman could do is like no wouldn't you rather like use your ability as a superhero to impress people and have them want to be really naked in front of you i don't know this is i i i i, I have this note that um I keep these, I keep notebooks. I'm obsessive about notebooks. And by obsessive, I mean like very disorganized with them, but I keep a lot of them and like- Cause it know, makes you feel organized, them. right? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love buying, oh man, what weird paper this one has. I need it. This one's a square. That'll I'm gonna easy. use this just to write down my bills in like- <laughs> Oh my, the amount of times that I've like bought a notebook and been like, I can imagine myself being the kind of artist who would sit 
in like under a tree and draw an entire comic in this book and i will limit the length of the comic to the length of this book and like i never think about shit like well it would be hard to scan it well it would be hard to ever publish this book <laughs> yeah. like dog shit if you fuck up one page your entire year is ruined but like I, I i think that i could do that you know in the same way that i think that like i would really like to hide out in the empire state building and work on a graphic novel for 40 years like in cavalier and clay um but I have this notebook and I keep this. I, I wrote this down when I was like 17 years old and I will mm -hmm. not part with it. And I've made a note underneath it that I think I wrote when I was in my early 20s that says like, this is not the kind of comic you want to make. And the note just says, can Superman's jizz fly? I don't think so. I, I think, there, you know, the I, I think the initial ejaculation probably would be powerful. But I mean, I don't know. Do, do, does this snot? Does this tears? Like, it's just bodily fluid, but, but, you know. But your, but your, your tears aren't live. Like so, so like obviously. I mean, what, bacteria in his stomach. Sure, that, that would, but that's within him. I'm saying that, like, when Superman, you know, does his wormy squirts, does it float around or does it land on things? I like the 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 one where uh, Spider Man his jizz gave uh, Mary Jane. We were talking about this on another show. Gave Mary Jane cancer because it's it was like toxic. <laughs> <laughs> What's up with us and sperm? I don't know. <laughs> I'm glad it's the theme of your show and not my influence. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, speaking of art, Richard, you have such a unique style. I've always, you know, every time I get you on, we always gush about it, you know. What, you know, when you're laying, laying down your panels and, and your work, you know, what type of routine do you like to get into? Do you listen to any sort of music or any sort of background noise or, you know, what does that look like for you? I try and find things that have been like going long enough that I can just leave them playing for like hours at a time without having to think about it. Um, like I, if I if I ever put in the effort to put together a playlist, or if I find a playlist that someone else has made that I like, um, uh, God, the, the one I really like is "Songs to Fuck To," but it's only like two hours. No, sorry, not "Songs to Fuck To." It's what is it? It's called "This Song Fucks." That's a very good playlist to work to in the mornings, but it's only like an hour and a half long. I want like a twelve-hour playlist, so I never have to look at my phone. I have no reason to like move away from my desk. Same reason I like to have like. A glass of wine because a glass of wine is something you can drink very slowly and i can drink over like seven hours and i don't have to get up because i'm like i i feel like a break oh there's a mouthful of wine okay i'm back to work see that's yeah. how i know i'm an alcoholic because it doesn't work like that for me <laughs> i mean i just call myself a professional writer and it makes it okay um but like i, I will do things I, if i find a podcast even if it's not, it's not a, a good podcast like i I watched all nine seasons of One Tree Hill last year when I was like working on uh, Four Color Heroes. And it just, it's a terrible show. And I can have it on in the background. I never need to look at it. Everyone's voices are different enough that I know who's talking and none of it is visually interesting enough to keep me engaged. But I know there's also nine years worth of this garbage. So I can just leave it playing and I don't have to think. I will watch anything that is run for that long. Um, I'm now listening to like any podcast I can find that has like more than a hundred episodes and I'll be like as long as they're tolerable I can do this. Yeah, so I, I love um, I'll listen to I do something similar to I like listening to like long format like video game analysis like I'll look and if it's like three six hours I'm like this is the one and I'll listen to it all day like throughout everything I'm doing it. It's just something like having i don't know what it is uh it's something like you're able just to join along on that ride you know what i mean you don't have to be immersed into it but you could go back to it at any point like during during a break and kind of just feel like you're engaged into something mm -hmm. yeah i miss dvds because dvds had audio commentaries like like putting on i don't know the simpsons with audio commentary because like you know the show so well already mm -hmm. they're just hearing other people talk about it it's just kind of fun or like, like they got they still got dvds richard there you just gotta go to the store man <laughs> okay but i would have to like get a dvd player i'd have to get you, know, you know what happened last time i bought a tv like i don't need to go into that again um that like pit of sadness i <laughs> i wrote in my my newsletter which is hasn't gone out yet but will be going out today i mentioned like the the time that i got convinced by a google ad that crash bandicoot was my best friend and i mentioned in it that this was also around the same time during covid when i uh started printing out pick or ordering prints by the way not just doing this at home ordering prints of my saved images from the google search community theater shrek <laughs> because the pictures made me laugh so i was like well those would make me happy if i had them in my real life i should stick them all over the walls of my office I love it. 
It was I a very it. sad time to be alive. Um, but, you know, so like, but that was also, like, that's when I was making Haunted Hill. You know, that's when I, like, this is a book that was made, uh, it started out as a six page story. It was meant to be a one and done thing. I had two days off between projects. The notes didn't come through on the, on the project it was meant to start. And so I had another two days. I made another six pages and then it just kept happening. And like, I am so like, it was going to be, you know, one night only tell the story of this woman getting home from her job interview to be the daytime janitor at Slammer. And then it has turned into, what if I followed every single moment of this woman's life? What if I like did a deep dive and I, like, I'm, I'm not going to reveal the ending of, of where the story is going, but I know that I only have 11 days worth of story to get to, like to get through. So how, how many days many... are... Or how, how many days are you currently at? You said you had, what, uh, 12 or 13 issues out? I'm at 13 issues, and I'm on the second day. Okay. Um, so, in like in the first story, it's all set in the first night, um, 1 through 6. She gets home. I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's around 11.30. Um, the next issue starts with her, like, the next morning. Um, and I had to do a jump because I needed issue nine had to end with her going out that night. And then I managed to do issues 10, 11, and 12 all on the second night and the early morning of the, of the second day. So I know where it's up to issue 13 kicks off at 8 PM that night. And I'm going to do a six issue run, which is going to cover about an hour of her life as she tries to do laundry and fails. Like I am, I am exploding every single moment of this to like, I, I can find ways for her to have interesting things happen um i've got scripts sort of figured out for later stuff but i don't know where it fits in like there's a three issue arc where she's sick in bed and i don't know how to fit that in because i don't want to waste a whole day but she's sick in bed and uh she has her 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 wife comes to like see her her wife has like decided if you're sick i'm gonna go stay at a hotel and has come back with a um a, a like gift basket full of nice things including a balloon that says get well <laughs> and Eva is just pissed off because she's like, you couldn't get me one that says fucking get well soon. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like why is this a command and not an encouragement? And like, like the kind of problematizing that she can do for anything is like my absolute favorite thing about her. I love it. Real right. quick, we have Afterglow Express. Uh, Richard, I only say good things about you over on YouTube and then J. Michael Miller on YouTube. These covers are fire. I have the covers, uh, you know, online on, on your website. I read uh, issues one through four and I just saved those covers. Knowing that fish on issue two, that fish has an interesting story. You guys are going to have to check out <laughs> what octopus. I think we kind of dive into the, the origins of that. It's so funny. I was talking to uh, my aunt and then um, uh, Bet J. Uh, Tone. Uh, she's a, a well known author on uh, Instagram. Uh, and mm -hmm. she was, they were both like, I want autobiographies. I, I was like, I have the perfect one for you. And I g got to talking about Octopus. And then I opened up the interiors. I was like, well, wait, maybe I should back this one away a little bit. Give them a little bit of a heads up, a little bit of a warning. <laughs> nah, come on. Anyone can handle Octopus. And then we have Afterglow Express. Uh, Richard wasn't saying how awesome he was, so I needed to bring the positivity. Richard, you are, yeah, you are awesome. You're one of my favorite individuals from the comic community. Like, anytime I can get you on the show, I'm always excited. Uh, you give me some of the best feedback. Like, if it wasn't for you, the Geeklies wouldn't have been a thing. Like, if, if you guys are listening and hearing that for the first time, like, Richard, like, single-handedly helped me save the Geeklies. Uh, and then any uh, big advice I've offered, you've always been there, like, to give me really sound advice. I mean, you really are, like, an outstanding individual, man. Listen, I'm not going to disagree. <laughs> I'm not going to say no. Keep it going. <laughs> Keep it going. <laughs> you know, look, I, I really, the thing is, like, I, I love comics. I think I've been very clear about that. I've been doing this for 31 years at this point. And, like, you know, making a living from it for over 20. Um... I I love comics, but I love like the community that you can have around comics as well. Mm -hmm. Like especially during COVID, things got so like shut down. But like even before COVID, I didn't really have like a a, a comic like an indie comic crew. I had I had you know, plenty of friends in real life who I would see, and a couple of them made comics, but like we never talked about comics. And now because of the internet and because of people like you. And because of like spaces on Twitter, which I'm in like probably too much and I'm probably too revelatory in them. But like I now have like a solid number of people who I get to talk to. You know, like last night I was um, I was on, on a space until well after midnight uh, talking to a handful of people about like some of the, the very real struggles that happened by like making comics and like how 
uh, demoralizing it can be when like mm -hmm. the world shifts even slightly and like independent art and any creative field is the first thing to get hurt by it um you know people i remember when when covid first hit i had a book launching like a week after the first lockdown started Oof. and and like the the publisher who was a, a new publisher you know in their defense but they said like this is going to actually be really good for us everyone's going to be at home everyone's going to want to read we will have massive sales and i said to them like that is not what's going to happen people are scared and people are going to go to things that are familiar and people are going to buy a lot more spider-man and a lot more batman and they're not going to fucking touch my book at all and i was right so the numbers for Spider-Man and Batman skyrocketed and the numbers for independent books really suffered through that. And like things kicked off later when like once there were no new regular comics coming out because everyone was pencils down, Kickstarter took off and like things started being better as a result. But like, man, like, w like one slight change and we are all just done, you know, and that's that's really tough. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it seems like anymore, left and right, there's things happening that is just hurting the industry or, you know what I mean? Or, or, or almost essentially like it looks like, you know, like it will in the future, like, you know, AR or AR, AI just started, you know, popping out of nowhere. And I mean, I don't think that's going to, you know, at this point in this time is going to really, you know, take away from the sequential side of things. But like people are starting to use it for, for that purpose, you know, yeah, or trying I mean, to at least. Not. I'm not that worried about AI. And like, this might be because like, I do a weird sloppy style of art. It's, it, it is what it is, but like, I don't think there's a lot of AI out there that's trying to mimic what I'm doing. Um, I don't, I, I think we are all focusing on the idea that AI is real artificial intelligence. It's not, it's still, yeah. it still requires someone to input something. It still requires like what the danger of AI is that we're going to end up with far fewer people being paid far more money to create the same amount of content. Mm -hmm. uh, because like an AI script is never going to work. An AI comic is going to be a gimmick that we all look back on. Like AI comics already look like the kind of shitty gimmick comics that we've seen in dollar bins for years. Yeah, yeah. Like they're going to be flashing the pan and they're going to disappear. And that's like, I'm not worried about that. You know, my biggest thing too is like, you, um... It, it feels so lifeless. I don't know how to explain it. It's like, it just, it feels like, what's the process, I guess? You know, I don't know how to, how to better explain it. It's just when you look at it, I don't feel the the same enjoyment. Like I was, there was this big thing going on where the uh, AI is like filling out the, the backgrounds for famous paintings like uh, Starry Night and the Mona Lisa. And I was looking at the Van Gogh one and like the AI part, you couldn't even see really the individual brush strokes. It was just like, process it was like dude this doesn't even feel alive well here, here's the thing right art is about the expression of human limitation it is about pushing against what we can do and like finding that limit and then pushing ourselves beyond <laughs> it like the point where we look at something and are amazed by it is not because it's a pretty picture it's because we can see the person in it we can see where they struggled we can hear when someone when a singer is trying to reach a note that is slightly beyond them and that mm -hmm. feels different. That is like, that is the the, the the thing when you have the walk through walls cheat on in Doom and you walk through a wall that is the edge of the level and it starts reverberating against you. And like, sure, it's annoying, but it feels like something. And AI art feels like nothing. By yeah. the way, for all the kids watching, Doom was a popular video game when I was a child. I still can't believe you just admitted to cheating, man. Richard, come on, come on. What? Oh, come on, what, like, what do you? He's I, like, I I'm legally blind, what do you want from me? <laughs> I've never played Doom without the cheats. IDDQD, IDKFA, IDDTD, I can't remember what that one was. That, was that walkthrough walls? IDCLEV1 and then jump to any fucking level you wanted there. Like, by the way, Doom 2, if you didn't use the cheats, there was no way you could kill Hitler. Yeah. All right, fair enough. So, fair enough. Fair enough. For the good of the yeah. world, use those cheats, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of art, though, I mean, pushing limitations... You have such a unique style. Uh, the, most of this book is like, you know, what, grayscale, um, but you add splashes of color during like mm -hmm. some some pivotal moments. I mean, what, you know, can we go ahead and touch base upon, you know, kind of like the style you want with with these interiors? Well, I wanted, like, when I started coming out with this book, it was, like I said, it was between two other projects. And I wanted something where I was like, not doing any of the parts that I don't enjoy. Um, so I wanted to remove 
any of the digital side of things. So everything's hand lettered, hand colored, hand drawn, everything. And I didn't want to have to be like cleaning up pages and removing any of the blue line pencil. So everything is done on like shitty sheets of paper. And then I use a light box to do the inks. And I want things to look like a finished page when I stop. I don't want it to, I don't, I don't, I don't have to feel like I have to change anything later. Um, so it's all done with gray wash. Uh, and then when it gets to any kind of like surreal or imagined sequence or a story being told or a flashback or whatever, I go into like some of the most lurid color I can possibly do. And I, for this, for the first two books of this, um, cause the second book is already finished production. Um, I have, uh, I actually photographed the pages rather than scanning them. So they're basically uneditable. But the system that I was using to do that was like slowly becoming more and more obsolete. And I'm at a point now where I was having to like do that using one computer and this machine that my former office mate had built for me and then like transfer onto a USB stick and then put it in my new computer because my old computer is so old I can't even use Dropbox on it anymore. And it was like, it was just becoming too much of a nightmare. And I knew the scanner would eventually break. And then it would be like, okay, I guess Haunted Hill can't happen anymore. So as of this week, I figured out a way to like get the almost exact same result, but with like, I'm still having to use like three different programs that are of varying quality to get different versions of a scan um, and then multiply them through each other. But it means that I can create this really lurid, over this oversaturated look for the colors. And it means that the, the finished product, like the printed product looks exactly like the original art. And that's something that I really wanted to capture because like scans, you always lose something. And I've, I've figured out a way to, and I'm sure I'm still losing something, but like to my eye, at least I'm losing nothing. And, you know, that's one thing I always loved about uh, your work too. Like Octopus, uh, the interiors of that are just like, it, I don't know how to even explain it. It feels so next level. It's like you're looking at it like you actually just kind of just finished the page right then and there. And I loved even like the little pieces of tape with the hair in the tape. Like there's just so many awesome, like small attention to details that you just, you, you, you make sure to put that love and that effort in everything you do. And it's just, it's remarkable to hearing how you're going about solving this problem for this book as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I don't like coloring. I don't enjoy it um, digitally. Uh, I don't enjoy using a tablet. I don't enjoy being on a computer if I can help it. Like I want to be, I want to feel the pen touching the paper. I want to have the finished product in front of me. I want to be able to, like, you know, if I, if I, like, I can grab, uh, like, here is page one of Haunted Hill. It looks exactly like page one of Haunted Hill in the book. There will be no difference between this and what you see. And like, I, I like that. It makes me happy to think that, you know, that is, that that is possible. And it means that like the, the joy that people get when they pick up a comic and they look at a finished page. Um, I want to feel that when I look at my finished page when it's drawn and with most of my other books, I'm having to look at things and go, okay, well that area looks really empty, but I know that I'm going to do a special technique there with the coloring, or I know I'm going to like put a gradient over this thing, or like this looks like a really flat area, but I'm going to really render it pretty hard later or some lights hitting that, or there'll be a color hold here or whatever. And with Horn Hill, it's like, I know the style I'm going for and I'm going to make it look exactly like I want it to look by the time I'm finished. I love it. I love that so much. And uh, so yeah, it's described as uh, surrealism. You know, I, I, you just you seem to like just that, that seems to be like your style, right? Like you just kill it uh, with that like sense of art. I feel, you know, what kind of like drove you to approach that style of, of art? Um, I think a lot of it is that like, you know, I, I've been working in kids books for quite a while at the point where I started this and uh, it gets you're very like locked into pairing ideas down to their simplest forms. Um, and you're very locked into the idea of like, well, we can't be talking for too long because we need to have the kids running somewhere or jumping a lot yeah. because that's really exciting. <laughs> and my challenge here was like, can I have like, this is a comic about people driving and walking and I managed to make it visually engaging. And yeah. like that, that challenge kept me focused the whole time. Oh, I love that. I love that. So let's go ahead. Let's pull up the Kickstarter, go through all these interiors up in, you know, the glory and uh, we'll check out all this hype. Uh, also, this is, you know, you just recently broke away from kids books not too long ago. Like, how's that been going for you? It's been really good. Like the response to Octopus was huge. I had like, obviously the campaign went well, but I also had 
I mean, I, I had someone leave their husband but for, because of, because they read that book. Like, that <laughs> means so much to me. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had, I, I'm not going to like reveal anyone else's secrets or whatever, or like talk about other people's lives too much. But like, you know, there, there are kids books that I've made where people have come to me and been like, oh, this, you know, I really enjoy this book, but it's a 10 year old saying, I really enjoy this book. And I can tell that what that kid is saying is, you know, I enjoy this book because it speaks to some trauma that I have, or it speaks to some terrible thing that I understand that I'm, you know, like that kid is connecting with the book for a reason. Um, it's the same as like when you when you see like an obviously gay kid with their horrible conservative family and you're just like oh you poor kid like as long as you just stay quite fabulous until you're old enough and they just move the fuck away like i i hope that i have a lot of books that you know that you know would get banned in florida i fucking love um, that i love it but but with um with like the adult stuff it's far more immediate and like i get to talk to people at conventions or on the internet and when they, you know, like, like recently, um, a, a new friend of mine, relatively new friend of mine from Twitter, 24 by four, um, amazing artist, uh, they were, they were complaining. They're like, why are there no books? Like, why is all of the like LGBT plus content, pride flag waving, happy stuff? Where are the books about like <laughs> grimy, grumpy lesbians who say real incel shit on the internet mm -hmm. uh, because they think it's funny? I'm like... Honestly, like, that's not everything I do, but that's certainly a part of what I do. I, I just, and I, and I was able to send them a, a story I just done uh, about a woman who orders Domino's because she's feeling bad about herself after a breakup <laughs> and then watches the Domino's pizza tracker as the pizza arrives and then after she's finished eating it as the pizza continues to be tracked through her body until she shits it out. Oh, I love and there's it. And <laughs> there's sharing comments out there. Yeah, yeah. And, I don't know, like, like the fact that that meant something to that person, the fact that like, I mean, like when I, when I first was uh, talking about Haunted Hill online was w around when I first met you and when I first met Stokes and like Stokes is one of my favorite people on, on Twitter, like really glad that we've become friends. He's obviously a relatively controversial figure who manages to get some beef with everyone he talks to at some point and doesn't like page turns, but like beyond that like just a good guy who is like a good writer right um and we talk a bunch and uh i think you and i can both say knowing him there is no world in which he would have picked up haunted hill and liked haunted hill if he didn't know me first yeah um, i mean not, i, I it's not good taste Right? Yeah, and you know it's 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 one of those things like you know I often wonder the same about me you know with a ton of these books that's why I'm often yeah. really really fucking grateful for doing this like a lot of people are like no thank you so much it's like no thank you like I get to read your book I get to meet so many interesting people um, and that's the beauty of it because as soon as I read this book like you know you don't need to be a middle aged you know woman uh, to to enjoy this there, there's so much relatable content and 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 what you produce uh, you're able to really connect to a lot of what you what you put out I mean. Like, you and, know, and people, like, like he, like th he loves this book and like when he latched onto this book and like really got it uh, and like he actually, I, I've, I've quoted him in my, in a couple of places recently because when he, uh, his description of Haunted Hill is he's like, I can, I know that Octopus is technically better, but I like Haunted Hill more. Yeah. And like, you know, this is, this is a guy who is not going to be reading books like mine normally that's what the internet has done for us it's opened things up mm -hmm. so like i can find the superhero books that i want i can find the weird gay shit that i want i can find the angry like but technically very well made comics that i want and like the fact that Hard hill is able to like connect so directly to people um has meant like just a crazy amount to me honestly so real quick, we are looking at Haunted Hill, the complete volume one, a surrealist soap opera about life in Hollywood, currently at 438 USD of a $1,470 goal, 14 backers, 27 days left to go. So, I mean, so far, you're almost, what, at half of the people that signed up within the first half hour? Congratulations. Here's a link for everyone that is watching. Be sure to check this out with us. You know, if you can't back, we would love to see you back. If you can't back... Put this on Facebook, put this on Twitter, anywhere you can. Word of mouth is 100% free. And I've read this. This definitely gets the geekly seal of approval. We just got another backer. Let's go, baby. Uh, nice. Man, let's go ahead and check out some of these interiors. So right here is the cover uh, for book one. You'll see, uh, I think it's Sasha, isn't it? Where she's fingering the donut? 
No, it's uh, I think it's Eva who fingers. Is it? it? Okay, okay. I remember they were talking. They were introducing around the uh, the table about what uh, on, Eva I, does. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're you're 100 right. It's definitely. Thank you. Right. Okay, I was like right there. Yeah. I was like, I'm not the creator, but I have a feeling I might be right. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that just means I'm paying attention. All right, I'm just trying to make sure I'm doing my end of things. <laughs> Look, it's been a while since I read that one. And I love just like that's. That's how you start, you know, the cover is one of the most important parts of the book. And that's how you started is this donut getting fingered. I mean, what, what drew you to that image? I think I just really like what I've been trying to do with all the Haunted Hill covers is capture um, the, the like straddle the line between off-putting and appealing. Like I want to draw something beautiful that makes you uncomfortable, that makes you feel like you feel like it's sexual, but you can't quite put your finger on how or what sexual thing it was meant to represent. You know, in the same way that like the exploded stress ball of issue five or like the boot smashing, like crush, slowly crushing the cheese balls of issue six. Or I mean, issue 13 has like the blob of spit on the, the phone screen with the fish on it. And like, it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to do because like the cover, the style of the covers is so different from the styles of the style of the interiors. But I want it to like, a cover should tell you what the comic is going to feel like, not necessarily yeah. what it's about. And I think that those covers do that. No, I, I agree. And as you guys can see, these interiors are just gorgeous. I mean, I love how it it, it feels so real uh, and you're able to do so much with the style. And it's so impactful. Most of it is in grayscale, but like these splashes of color, just I, I just love it. Thanks. So right here are some sample pages. Let's go ahead and check these out as well. Uh, we have the initial meeting of Eva and Sasha right here. And I love how you're able to capture, you know, uh, the shirts. I, we talked about that, I think, our first interview, like how, how fun those shirts was. But I loved how you captured the essence of like what it would be like to be middle-aged, trying to connect with that younger generation, you know, like especially in the diner scene when, you know, she butts in on that relationship and they're like, yo, not cool. Like, what are you doing? And yeah. she's just trying to do the right. She's just like probably for her day and age, that would have been maybe a nice thing to do. But like you got you got to well, adapt with the times. I don't even think it would. I think it's that like when we get to a certain age, so I'm, I'm 38 now, um, we start to think like, we, we you, you start looking at stuff that you would have done when you were 20, 25 and say like, that was bullshit. Why didn't I say something? Mm -hmm. And so then you start saying things. And of course, everyone who you're saying it to is like, no, 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 you can't say that. Because the truth is like, one of the things about butting into someone else's relationship is it's very rare that you have insight that they don't already have. Yeah. If someone's having a fight, if someone's boyfriend is being shitty to them, they actually know he's being shitty to them. They know he sucks. And like, sure, you can reinforce that and help them get out of it. You know, it's nice to hear that someone else sees that he sucks. But the truth is, you're not giving them something new. You're like, and, and Eva, the good thing about Eva is that she's always calling people out on stuff. She's always technically right. But by being right, she never has to actually like address how problematic she is with all of mm -hmm. her behavior. Like, like that first page with or the second page rather, where she gets the cigarette, like she gives Sasha the cigarette and gets her cigarette lit as a result. Like, there is a reason that for these six issues, Sasha is her best friend in the story. It's because they have a transactional relationship. Yeah. And Eva is like very happy to be on board for that. And right here we get our first instance of colors. She's having the flashback of Slamtown. So, uh, and I remember our first interview so freaking vividly. You went into great detail about uh, what, like this dude getting rimmed is uh, your your husband or modeled after your husband. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And so, yeah. like, I, I remember telling my mom she was like very super supportive. I was like, be careful about this episode. It might get a little spicy. <laughs> I think he has such a specific hairline that like everyone who sees that they instantly like, oh, that's the top of Ray's head. <laughs> <laughs> and I love how uh, Sasha at first was like, oh, that's gross. But like, I mean, I don't know when you're 35, when you're 40, you've been exposed to it a ton. Like, it's just another nine to five to you, right? Like, exactly. And like, as Eva, um, I can't remember if it's in this volume or later, but she says that she considers cleaning up gay men's jizz to be a feminist uh, act because um, it was never going to be weaponized against women anyway. I love that. And another thing I love too is how her cigarette smoke is like drifting into like the flashback. Like it's such your your attention to detail with this is, is just phenomenal. Well, you know, if you're if you're drawing what you love, it's weird. Everyone thinks of, of Haunted Hill as like my dirtiest book. Um, but like that page is probably the most 
sexual of the pages in it so yeah. far or at all. And like, you don't even see a single dick. Octopus had two dicks in it. Yeah, yeah, th I, there was, yeah. <laughs> Although there is, as you'll see later, there is a very not safe for work cover that does have 18 dicks on it. You had to up those numbers. You're like, you know what, screw it. Those numbers, th these are rookie yeah. numbers too, like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like 18 on a cover is pretty good. Right here is another, another gorgeous. I just, I, I love this. Like how it just goes from grayscale and then it's just very vivid f splashes of color here. Yeah, I, I love doing stuff like this because you know, like with with the change in how like comic coloring happens now with digital colors, you get a lot more use of color holds to like give different value to different points of an image, and you so rarely see that in physical drawing because it, or traditional drawing because you're mostly just using black lines or gray. Um, and so being able to do these like colorful outlines on things and really create the sense of like them being separate from the world to show that like they are not really going to be on this water slide. They're not really going to be on the tongue of a giant fucking monster. They're not really going to be like putting out the cigarette onto that tongue, but like by keeping them, like I get to show them doing that, but by keeping them in black and white and then properly outlined, it gives that separation. That is just so next level, man. And it, I, I am here for this. This book is great. Uh, everyone watching right here is the link. Be sure to check this out with us. We're gonna go through the rewards and the all the tiers right now. And like I said, if you get back, we would love to see it, but simply putting this wherever you can works just as well. Uh, had a couple backings while we even had the campaign pulled up for that. Oh, nice. So anyone who did that, you know, thank you so much for, for backing this while we are live as well. We always love to see that. Uh, and the book uh, is done, right? Like 100% completed. Yeah, the book, the book, I should also say that anyone who backs in the first 48 hours, I just decided this this morning, there's a graphic right at the top, but anyone who backs in the first 48 hours, Thursday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific, I'm going to be sending you chapter one of my new book, The Ex-Wives of Frankenstein, digitally. Ooh, so, let's like, go. Only way anyone, you'll be the first people in the world to see it. No one has seen it except me at this point. And I, I'm like, I'm working on page eight, which is the last page of chapter one. Mm -hmm. so like first 48 hours that's your that's your that's your motivation get in there and then we have the not safe for work uh cover and right here everything behind the pink splash yeah you could you can imagine uh these are all filled with dicks and uh most of them are old dicks right or there there's some some uh no, no, i i wanted to do a real range like i like okay. old dicks that's my, my taste but like i go to enough of these places that i i mean look i even had to cover parts of the logo because it's got yeah. cum all over it um uh, yeah, there's there's a full range of dicks, different sizes, different shapes, different angles, different colors, different levels of wrinkliness, and with different attachments on them. Um, I I uh, I just really tried to. Oh, sorry, someone's calling me. I'm like, what the fuck are you? Know I'm in an interview. Let me just put my phone on. Do not disturb. No, no, go go ahead, go ahead. You're fine. Richard is a busy 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 businessman. I'm sure it's something about like some important stocks or. You know something <laughs> no it's, it's, it's my friend my friend alex who does all my music for me he's in can at the moment because uh a film of his uh or a film that he did the score for has just won like every single award that's let's possible. go congratulations so, yeah by the way we like have... if you're if anyone's ever jealous of the music that i have in my videos or like the theme song to blastosaurus or black sand beach or like the upcoming theme song to haunted hill top secret thing like alexander burke fucking genius musician who does all of that for me we have a uh, afterglow express saying uh covers look fantastic also a sketch cover as well so what are some of the limitations to this can they have the eva doing anything you know they they want you or anyone and like, like look you have to look at how i draw and say to yourself what could richard draw well like if you want to see like grimace golden on the hamburger's nut sack like i will draw that for you and i'll draw it really fucking well and i'll use all the right colors so i'm very good at drawing those characters if you want to have eva smoking a cigarette i can also do that if you're like hey i want a jim lee style batman you're gonna be quite disappointed by what you end up with what about a jim lee style batman, batman holding a dick <laughs> no like like look i have a i have a sloppy weird style you look at i mean i look, look i'm very good at drawing dicks i can draw a dick real well <laughs> he's like all right but we like, might we might consider that like <laughs> but the batman won't look as good <laughs> I mean, I just, I, after doing the, the Haunted Hill cover, which I put out online when I first drew it last year, and I immediately got um, a commission to do like two other sexy covers with dicks on them by other comics. So like, I'm starting a revolution. Now this is the big exciting thing. You can get pages of the original art. So all of every page of Haunted Hill is done pencil first on a separate piece of paper and then I ink it with a light box. Um, so you can get for 50 bucks, 50 Canadian bucks, so like 38 us i think um you get uh 
a page of the original pencils, fold it up inside a copy of the book. I love that. That so, is so like, cool. You're like the book. The book I think is thirty two. So you're you're paying like twelve dollars or something for a page of original pencils. And, and I got it. That's it. I gotta, I gotta ask too. I mean, you know, I don't think we ever dove into this, but you're legally blind. You can only see out one eye three percent. I mean, what is it about traditional that you like? Is it the texture of the paper? You're able to like just like look at it. I mean, because with digital, you you would be able to zoom in to, for the detail. So what is it? What is it about that digital or traditional aspect of it that draws you into it? Well, it's two things. So one, because I only have one working eye, three dimensions are kind of difficult for me. Okay. Um, I like the world looks pretty flat. When I translate things onto paper, I am flattening the world. And like, I've been drawing since I was three years old. I've been like making books since I was three years old. Mm -hmm. And like, that is like, it's my favorite thing in the world to do. Cause I'm able to take something how I see it and then show other people what I'm seeing. Um, I love that. When I'm drawing like physically, like traditionally, I can like feel the paper, I can touch the paper, I can get close to the paper, but there's still that limitation. Like that thing I said, like art is about pushing against the limitation. I can only do what a pen can do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I, I always say that like ink can only come out of a pen at a certain rate. So actually I probably am still faster at Superman at drawing. Um, uh, but when I work digitally, one, there's no nice feeling to it. Two, you can always undo things. And I love fixing mistakes like or changing things to accommodate mistakes. And then two, there's always like the little, because I'm so close to it with like my eye so close to the, uh, the, the nib of the pen, like that thin layer of glass or whatever the screens are made of uh, is enough to mean there's a disconnect with what I'm drawing and what I'm seeing. And I can see that I'm at an angle to see that gap. So I, digital is just horrible for me. No, I, I love that. And I, I love hearing what all goes into your work. I think it's important as an interviewer, interviewer to be able to dissect that, you know, between the creators. So my audience can really understand who you are. I mean, let's go ahead and dive into some of these rewards. We've seen the pictures of them, but let's go ahead and check out some of these prices as well. So we have the, you know, 10 bucks or more about $8 USD. I'm going to give, go ahead and say these all in USD terms. So that's a little bit easier. So about $8 US, uh, USD, you get the digital books of the PDF of this. How many pages is this thing going to be? Uh, it's 128 for the PDF. But <laughs> oh I'm, my God. I'm going to be bumping that up a little bit with like some other little bonuses. I'm going to throw in the pizza story um, for that. And again, if you back on the first 48 hours, you get that first eight pages of um, Exiles of Frankenstein as well. Um, if can you, can you scroll like right to the top for a second? I want to see, show the graphics. So people can see the sexy green lady I'm doing. Right there. And you've been sharing yeah, some of this art uh, on um, Twitter as well, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm so excited about this book. Um, it's like, I'm so sick of there being stories where like the Bride of Frankenstein shows up at the last minute. I want to create her as a real character and show what it looks like with the day that... This is a, this is a story about uh, the day that Elizabeth Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein find out that their husbands have been found alive, frozen in the Arctic in a super gay position. <laughs> and a famous gay science couple uh, and, and it all like, yes i'll be honest it did all start as a joke where someone said grace and frankenstein and i was like actually there's something there um so it's 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 another story about two ladies having a nice day together and not really being friends but i get to do like a lot of sexy green women <laughs> yeah no that is um, anyway. awesome i love that i love that let's go ahead we have uh, Gary Hodge. Richard is a mad genius talent. People need to check out his books. I agree. I agree as well, 100%. Uh, so we have, after the PDF, at $21 USD, you can get the Early Bird Haunted Hill Volume 1. So you said that's over 120 pages of physical content. What a hell of a bang for your buck. You can get at $25 uh, Haunted Hill Volume 1. Uh, that's after the Early Bird Special. Then we have the Not Safe for Work variant coming in at $30 bucks USD. So you can get that cum covered, dick spectacular cover um, at an outstanding I price. Clear, like all the cum has UV spot treatment. So it is the shiniest stuff on the cover. I wanted to get glow in the dark so bad, but I just couldn't make it happen. So what, what, what about that? Was there just like two, like would the whole book been glowing or? No, it, I would have just had like all all the cum spots and all the cum on the logo would have been glow in the dark. But the the technology for printing in specific places like that just isn't kind of there yet, mm -hmm. um, or at least not that I had access to. And the only place that could do it was like, look, it won't glow that well. Because what I wanted here's the dream: you walk into someone's house, it's dark, you see something glowing on their bookshelf. You're like, what is that? You walk over, you pull it out, it's covered in cum. I, it should have been the the black light though. That would have been a little bit better, right? Because that's what actually makes it show up, isn't it? 
No, see, oh, everyone always thinks this. Everyone always thinks that Blacklight makes cum show up. Now, I have Blacklight out of my uh, one of my offices. Richard's like a cum office. expert. He's like, hold on. I'm a cum expert. <laughs> uh, like, I have all this black, cause, you know, like Blacklight makes um, uh, uran is it uranium glass? The green glass it glows under Blacklight. Mm -hmm. So I have Blacklight. My, my office, one of my offices, used to be a haunted house. Um, so the, the the uranium glass all glows under black light, so I have all of this black light on the ceiling as strips, and I have all of the weird, like, old pieces of glass from the 1920s all around the place. So the whole place glows green. It feels very cool. And so I'm out there one day. I'm like, I wonder if it's really true, because I've never tested this out. So I, like, just, you know, jerk one out, and I check it. <laughs> it so I look it up. It wasn't even it horny. He's out. like, this is for science. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I look it up, and it turns out you have to like spray something on it. Like when cops go to a crime scene, they spray luminol on the stuff, and it makes blood and cum glow. Okay. So like the idea that you could like have your own battery operated blacklight, take it into a motel room, is bullshit. You know, you just like unless you're spraying luminol in, in the whole place, you have no fucking clue what you're sleeping on. Okay, okay, you totally just ruined every episode of Criminal Minds and CSI out there, but, you know, we're, we're in here, we're in here. So if you're out there and you're looking to see if you're swimming in, you know, you got to have that spray on you. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's an add-on for uh, Volume 2. You, you include, like, a little... I really, I wanted to, like... If this book takes off, I think the stretch goal should be like a flashlight with a donut as the entrance. Oh my god, that's so awesome. We have, like like Richard said, original art with the book at 37 bucks. Like, holy crap, that is a steal. Uh, this is limited to, you got 99 pages left. So, I mean, do they get to pick a page or do you just put one in at random? I'm going to be putting it in at random. Um, if, like, if you... If you've bought that and you want to like hit me up as soon as you have and be like, is this page available? I can probably make it happen, but you know, I can't guarantee anything. And then we have at uh, 56 bucks USD, you get that sketch cover. So any character you want, if you want, uh, want her smoking a cigarette, get her holding smoking a cigarette, maybe holding a massive dildo. You know, I know on Octopus you did that too, where the tentacles could hold anything they wanted. So I drew so many dicks for that. Everyone wanted that, dicks. That's beautiful though, isn't it? That's exactly that sounds like a dream. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> well, no, because then you got to keep taking breaks. Just, so do you like? Do you have like a reference that you have to look at, or, or does it just come straight no, to I, mind? I was, I was doing a joke to say my own drawing gets me horny, which is <laughs> actually, something I was when I was in high school. Someone asked me; they were like, "Hey, can you draw like naked chicks and stuff, so you don't have to buy porn?" I'm like, "What? <laughs> what?" <laughs> They were hard up. They were hard up. We have Gary just back the Not Safe for Work cover edition. Good luck, Richard. Thank you, Gary. We always love to see you back on the show. So thank you so much for that as well. Uh, then we have the at fifty nine dollars the Richard Sucks collection. So give us what this is. this is everything that you have on the Richard Sucks label. Yeah. So 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 far it is uh, Haunted Hill, Octopus, Horror Shorts, and Too Hot for Octopus, the handwritten journal of follow up stories to Octopus. Um, you get the hot, the shitting behind Hollywood sign print. You get the digital Richard Sucks collection, which is like my full back catalog of everything that I that I own the rights to. Uh, and then you get the uh, the donut sticker, which is going to be big. It's going to be like a like four and a half by four and a half big ass sticker. So you can like, as I keep saying to people, like it's perfect for your briefcase, your laptop, or to slap it right on your grandma's coffin before it goes down. Put your Shoo! fingers in my ball. The, the like, love the, you, grandma. The donut image. <laughs> Love you, Grandma. And then uh, also, uh, this, is the spit sticker not included in that one, or? Oh, uh, no. The spit sticker comes with the ultimate collection, which is okay. later on. So you get all three covers. So you can get that sketch cover, the not safe for work, and then the regular cover at seventy-four USD. And then the ultimate Richard Sucks collection uh, that's going to get you some awesome uh, pictures as well. I love this. This is so cool. So yeah, so you get the spit sticker. You get, you get everything I said before. You get the spit sticker. You get a page of original art with that, and then you get. A Polaroid. So when I was um, when I was leaving Hollywood, I went around and like took pictures of all my favorite places because like that's the kind of weirdo I am. Um, and I was like, I've got I'm limited to how many Polaroids are in a roll. And I had one left in the camera, and I had a, another pack, uh, and I couldn't go into any stores because this is like peak COVID times. Uh, and so we've got uh, there's actually one picture of me designing Sasha. There is me next to the sign that says no pooping. That was what a block away from my house. Yeah, you want to hold you want you want to hold you want to hold one up. Oh, sure, sure, sure. So there's there's the no pooping sign on the sidewalk by my house. Like, enough people had to be shitting there that they had to do this. Here's the, uh, I'll hold the wallet. Here's the uh, me designing Sasha in my spooky office with the black light where I come all the time. 
Um, here is <laughs> Crossroads of the World, the world's first shopping mall, which is where my office is. Um, fucking coolest place. It's where they go in issue two. Uh, in, in yeah, in issue two, when uh, uh, Jill and Eva and Kevin go looking for perfect bounce, they wander away from Hollywood High, and, which I call Haunted Hill High, obviously, and they wander through Crossroads of the World and they see the fish. I've got the Sad Market up on Yucca, which is where they go for the comedy show. I've got Werewolf Heart Studios, which is where I used to live. Um, it's actually Ryan Gosling's old recording studio, and so all the walls were covered in like his paintings, and they're all like these murals of like cemeteries and werewolves and shit. I would have um, so never guessed Ryan of... Gosling painted. Yeah, yeah, he's he's like quite a good artist actually. Um, and like so, his band Dead Man's Bones. Uh, Alex, who I mentioned earlier, who does all my music, my best friend, he uh, was the keyboardist for that uh, group, and so he and I both lived at Werewolf Heart Studios um, in Whitley Heights. Uh, so this is the house that they that Sasha and Eva break into in issue six. Um, uh, yes, it's actually it's actually been torn down since then, which is a real shame. But it was a, also a terrible fucking place. It, that's where I that's the studio where I was eating the popcorn and um, uh, Posh Spice came and tried to steal my fucking popcorn and then got disgusted when she was eating it and saw that I'd been spitting the kernels back in whenever I found one. Um, <laughs> there's the, the real uh, Treo's coffee and donuts. Um, in the book, it's Karn's Coffee and Donuts. It's all themed around Richard Karn because in my world, one of the ongoing jokes in Hard Hill is that every place they go is themed around a different celebrity. Um, so there's uh, Snoop Dogg walking, there's uh, Karn's Coffee and Donuts, and later, in a later volume, there is, uh, there's a place called Sushi Stop, which is a mm -hmm. chain around LA, uh, and in my version it's called Sushi Stap, and they're trying to theme a sushi place around Scott Stap, but there's not a lot of crossover in puns. Oh um, my god, so dude! There's, like, there's a, a, a sign in the kitchen with a chart for which knives to use. It just says, "What's this knife for?" All the little dishes for soy sauce have the guy from the Human Clay cover coming up out of them. Um, the <laughs> but there's this great bit where they're talking at like Eva and uh, Andy, a, a character who comes in later, are talking about it, and she says, "So you're saying you're you're saying that like they they really screwed themselves by having to like come up with these puns after they came up with the name?" And she's like, "Yeah." She's like, "So you're saying they." created their own prison it's fucking dumb can you take um, me higher i don't know <laughs> I've, got, I've got a photograph of the real slammer um from outside at night i've got a photograph of the fish this is like the photograph of the fish from the crossroads and, and hit up octopus's interview for the interesting backstory on that one someone actually yeah, did that, use that, that mouth that fish, that fish is the cover of issue two of horn hill and then uh in issue three uh junior freaks out he's the homeless guy they pick up because um he realizes that this fucking weird ass mural on Bronson is like it's it's a it's a dumpling about to be eaten. But look at the tongue, right? The tongue is uh, goes on the wrong side of the fucking teeth, and that's the whole thing that freaks him out. That makes him feel like he's being eaten by the dumpling. So like all of those. So each um, each of the Ultimate Collection comes with one of the Polaroids that were on the wall of my spooky cum soaked office as i uh as i developed and wrote haunted hill so and get one of those sprays and be sure to spray it on one of those photos you don't know if any anything splashed onto it you could have a little bit of richard for the low low price so <laughs> <laughs> i still can't believe you did it you weren't even horny you're like you know what's for science let's pop one off real quick like <laughs> haven't, you, haven't you wondered yeah, yeah. I, I, I just I, I I don't think I've ever been like you know chilling in a black light on. I'm like you know what like. Fuck, you know, just let's go. Playing laser tag and take a break in the corner. <laughs> Cody, what are you doing? I'm recharging. Get out. <laughs> so Richard, for anyone who might be on the fence about backing, you know, what would you like to say to them after going through that Kickstarter? After you know diving into the ins and outs of what went into this, what would you like to say to them to kind of help push them over that fence to help them back this project? I mean, look, if you're not, if you're horribly off put by me at this point, then I don't know what to tell you. Like this, my work has gone from being family friendly and, and whatever to being like raw and weird and sloppy as fuck. But the thing is, I've been doing this for 31 years. I'm very good at making comics and the kind of people who, the kind of people who wouldn't like my kind of comics seem to fucking love this thing. And I think that's really what speaks to it. Like, there's there's no better endorsement than the fact that people who people who shouldn't are into this. Yeah. Um, and also, Jesus fucking Christ, it's the cheapest shit book. Like, it's what twenty one US original for art for fucking thirty days. bucks or whatever is like yeah, for ridiculous. For original art, uh, you know, it's it's there's a lot here, and so so just, just fucking get it and get it in forty eight hours so that you can get that eight pages of like a sexy Frankenstein lady covering her stitching with lipstick and showering 
Um, mm. It's going to be a weird ass book. <laughs> so speaking I'm, of I'm that, gonna, I'm go gonna ahead. like I'm gonna do something exciting with Haunted Hill. Like here's here's the thing. I'll, I'll reveal this. Haunted Hill is set pre-COVID, okay? Because I wanted to remember the Hollywood that I lived in that I loved so much, right? But I accidentally started it, and I'm spe specific about the date. It is actually 12 days before the first lockdown. So I only have 11 days worth of time to fill, and I am setting myself the challenge of can I do a story that takes 11 days but that, that breaks the world record for longest-running comic by a single person? I love and that. That's going to be really fucking hard because the other part of it is I will walk away from this the second I do a bad volume. Like yeah. the second it gets boring, the second it doesn't work, like I'm I'm my own biggest critic. So like follow me on this fucking journey as I like make this fucking thing happen and drive myself mad in the process. I'm like, here, I want to I want to be able to do something longer than the Cerebus without losing my mind and writing essays about how terrible women are. How long was Cerebus? You know, like, uh, it's like 300 issues. But he also had someone else draw his background, and he lost his mind and talked about women being terrible. So fuck yeah, him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Fuck Sirius. He was also stuck in Canada, so I have some some sympathy. So, um, man, that is such a impactful thing too to have have this happening before COVID. You know, I was thinking about this is so weird you know when 9 11 happened that's when a lot of people in my age group and maybe maybe for you but for at least around my age group that's when you know when you think of blockbuster and you think of of all that shit, you're truly remembering your childhood before 9 11 you're remembering what yeah. life was like before shit got shitty and i think about mm -hmm. covid and it's like almost like the same thing like my kids like their life before covid and after covid are different it was different yeah. and covid had a big impact and i was listening to the study like and like we haven't seen the true repercussions of it and probably like a year or two when we see some of these children start to grow up and, and develop like psychology you know what this did to their psychological being like mm -hmm. we have yet to even see like here's the thing we there was this magical time at the beginning of covid where we were all um, I mean, okay, okay, look, the fighting started pretty early, but like a lot of us were in full lockdown. We were like, really, like we were taking it very seriously and it was awful and a lot of people were dying. I don't want to diminish that at all, but there was a part of it that was, um, it was like a big slumber party. It was like- Yeah, you got, we off, you got a big check time. every other week, right? Like, I mean, sure. I mean, I, I wasn't, I wasn't an American. So I, I didn't, you got fucked. I mean, like I got pretty, fucked. I got fucked um, too. I got fucked too. Uh, I mean, my, like, for, everyone got fucked. everything was really bad, but we were all going through bad stuff together. And it felt like, um, it's, I always say that like, I don't want to go outside until it's raining and I can't. And like that feeling of like, we're all stuck inside. We're all going through something. We're all calling each other with like the hierarchy of distance has been abolished from friendships. And we're all like having these, like the, the, you know, we were buying fucking chemicals to spray on our foods to keep ourselves safe, but making ourselves sick by doing that. And like just weird, but it was, it was, it was exciting. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the kids, I think kids were sort of sheltered from that part of it. So they don't even have like, they just have the, oh, remember that time that things were shitty, but I didn't really know why. And I didn't, I didn't really get to have... see my friends. I didn't get to go to school. Yeah. I didn't get to go outside. Like I was stuck in the house. Like for me, I feel that dude, for me, when this happened, uh, you know, with one of my children, I paid child support. Uh, and that, you know, that's, that's, that's not a problem. But when this happened, my job kept me employed enough to where, they, cause I worked at AT&T. So fuck AT&T by the way. But uh, okay. they were considered an, an essential, um, you know, item. Like everyone needed a phone. Like how else are you supposed to, if you have an emergency? So I was able to go to work. They kept me em uh, employed enough to where I didn't meet the requirements to get unemployment or that extra check, you know, the extra amount you got or whatever. Uh, yeah. And then child support deducted enough for me to where I wasn't even surviving. Like I did, I wasn't able to get assistance uh, and I wasn't able, like, any money that did come my way, like, it didn't help because, like, my job kept me working enough to where I wasn't eligible for unemployment. The boss, though, was able to take enough hours off to get her unemployment, which that was mm. fantastic. Fuck them for that. Yeah. But I remember when COVID happened, um, I was almost homeless. Like, I, it took me months of digging out of that. So, like, dude, I fucking feel that. Like, that must have been miserable for you. It was, it was really rough. And, like, um, <laughs> you know, like, I was... The, 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 the thing about the thing about the first parts of COVID is that like Hollywood was like Hollywood kept it weird. Like that's what we fucking do. It like I mean I know that Austin's whole thing is keeping it weird, but that's a very family friendly, acceptable kind of weird. Um 
Hollywood just was like, we're just going to lean into what we're doing. Um, in those first few days, I was still going into my office because everyone else abandoned Crossroads. So it was just a ghost town. Um, and so I could walk there from my house. I didn't have to interact with anyone. And it was, I, I think I, I might have told you this story. I don't know if it was on the show, so I'm sorry if I'm repeating. But um, the all the gun stores started doing home delivery because everyone was scared. And all of the courier companies stopped requiring signatures because no one wanted to like be face-to-face -face with people. So mm -hmm. all of these guns were being left on doorsteps. And um, so I'm walking. And like there's, and also there's no one on the streets. There's like a, the, like the homeless population of Hollywood are really suffering the most through this because they have no like they have no like spare change being given to them yeah that's that's a livelihood yeah and so I'm, I'm walking um uh walking to my office and I, i'm like looking at my phone and i trip on something and i look down and there's a fucking ar-15 sticking out of the door out of the flap of this tent outside of the 7-eleven and like the guy like pokes his head out i'm like and he like th this is the guy who junior is based on um mm -hmm. who i have like known now for i guess six years um and he goes oh Oh, you're cool. You're okay. And I was like, I've Whoa. never, never been better. Like, felt better. Like to be like, I've, I've bought that guy maybe a hundred sandwiches at this point. <laughs> that Snickers paid oh, off. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, no one was uh, collecting in the bird scooters. And when bird scooters batteries start dying, they start chirping very loudly to let you mm -hmm. know that they need to be collected and then recharged. And so when there's no cars on the street, everything echoes more. And so this one night I'm walking home, maybe three days in. And all of the bird scooters start screaming and it's just <sighs> echoing through the hills. It was just like, that's the kind of weird shit that like, um, like I will get to remember those first few months. I will get to like really hold on to that. It's like, that was, a, they, they, it felt like it was years because mm -hmm. it was such a huge change. But for kids who just were like, I don't go to school anymore and I don't really know why. And now with no warning, I'm not seeing anybody. And I don't know. Most kids probably not don't able have... to see family members too, like grandmas, grandpas, yeah. because elderly did, were did like. You, did you get to see your kids at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. So my thing is like I got my kids the entire time. I uh, okay. and like I, I'm like definitely I'm like one of those dads like where I don't give a fuck what's happening like unless it's like death like i'm getting those kids you know what i mean like um you know we took precautions though like if if someone was sick you know i would keep the kids a, a longer you know what i mean until they were until they were healthier or vice versa if there was a covid scare in the family we kept the kids until yeah. they, they were okay you know so we, we we made sure we did our end but there's no way like it's gonna take hell or high that water was, that was just like a, a reality for like i mean you know i have a lot of family in new zealand obviously um and a lot of people there, like the lockdowns were so extreme, you weren't allowed to travel more than like half a mile from your house. And oh, yeah. so kids were like, like if, if you were, and there was no warning to the first lockdown. So it was like, if you're at your dad's for the weekend, you're never coming home. Yeah. Um, and it was just like, that's just really fucking Well, Liv, Liv was in California visiting family and she got stuck there uh, six months. I think wow because uh, because airlines uh weren't flying yeah. um you couldn't you couldn't get a flight no matter what um and um if you did when they did start doing flights there was the fear of quarantine when you would land you'd have to wait a week or two that that was a fucking thing you'd have to wait sure. a week or two uh and then your shit could get canceled and then you're stuck in a whole fucking different state you know yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it, I, it, I had to i had to go back to new zealand because my visa to the u.s got canceled I was in Canada, but I didn't have residency there, even though I'm married to a Canadian. Uh, and so I could only stay for a few months and I had to fly back to New Zealand, which is fucking terrifying. I was like masked and like, I, I like not touching anything, didn't eat or drink or use the bathroom for a 13 hour flight. Um, by the way, got stuck at LAX for five days that like I ate a lot of Panda Express and lost a lot of weight because you shit yourself so fast yeah. with that stuff. Um, <clears throat> more like Panda implied. Um, it's a dumb joke. Uh, <laughs> I laughed on the inside. I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna give you that on the air. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's like when you, I, I, always, I do this all the time. Whenever, whenever Ray says, "Should we use the express checkout?" I say it'll be more, more effective than the implied checkout. Nothing. Um, anyway, uh, I had to go to New Zealand, and then I had to quarantine in a hotel room for two weeks. And I literally did not leave that room for two weeks. And it, it, like, that's a hard fucking thing to do. You're on oh, your yeah. own limited like and they they limit like you cannot have anything coming i smuggled in three bottles of whiskey hidden you had cabin fever chest. too right oh completely like but like we were allowed to go out into this exercise yard and walk around but i was like well 
this is pre-vaccine. Why are you locked yeah, up or like, something? Like you get yard yeah, time. Yeah, like, they, they, they put up fences around the hotel, like barbed wire. <laughs> there's military people with guns. Like everything is like there. You are not allowed out um, at all. And uh, you're out, allowed out to this exercise yard, which is an old parking lot. And people who went out there could talk to each other at a safe distance. And I was like, I'm not going to do that because what if one of them gets COVID? Then my yep. quarantine is going to end. And I, because I never left my room, I got to leave after 14 days. And everyone who'd been in the exercise yard, who'd been on my flight, had to stay for another seven because someone tested positive. And so you got, like, you got on a good I mean, time. I, I see you. <laughs> it was it was it was bad though. Like like I like I watched every episode of James Bond Jr. I read a lot of Wikipedia articles. I built a fort out of my bed. Um, developed a real close relationship with a plastic skeleton like it was it was you want wilson on him (laughs) (laughs) so richard uh we do have to wrap this up i could always end up talking to you for you know for hours on these things but we got to save some juice for uh, our next launch party that's happening what in a month yeah, we got we got uh, four color heroes next. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So that I mean, we gotta save some juice for that. So uh, let's go ahead and start wrapping things up. I mean, for anyone, um, dude, as someone who is literally legally blind with three percent vision in your eye, um, as so, like, so let's say there's someone out there who is just struggling accepting their art, you know, and and they're working on getting their art to a point where they're satisfied with it, but they just have a hard time just even starting. What'd be the biggest piece of advice you could offer them? I mean, the truth is that no one's satisfied with their art, right? Like, it doesn't matter if you're the, you know, if you're J.H. Williams or Bill Sienkiewicz or Richard. You have no fucking clue if your art is ever going to be, like, we don't want to be content. We want to be struggling. We want to be creating something that is better than the last thing, or if not better, at least different. Um, the, the people who, who get bored, the people who stop, are the people who get real good at drawing one thing and keep doing it. Those are the people whose art becomes soulless. Um, you know, I... Uh, I don't do fan art. Uh, I never really have. I've never drawn anyone else's characters. Um, and I started a couple of years ago each morning just doing a warm-up sketch, not because I wanted to draw other people's characters, but because I wanted to learn why people made the decisions they did. So and I'd, like the best way to do that is be like, I'm going to start drawing this character and I'll see what I can do to change their face or change their pose and then figure out like, well, what does this eyebrow shape do that allows me to turn the head in a different way? Or like, you know, does Hey Arnold look good from the side? He does not. Does, he does not. Um, but like, but Helga does because her head's a fucking ball with lines on it. Like, like it's brilliant design. Mickey Mouse has circular ears from the front and the sides, so in theory they should be perfectly spherical, but they're not. They're flat. Like, there's a there's a lot of weird things that you start realizing as you're drawing other people's stuff. Um, but that like the only thing that made it worthwhile was that I was pushing it in new directions every time. I've never drawn the same thing twice. Um, so like that, like if you if you're feeling shitty about your art. Don't compare it to your anyone else. Compare it to yourself, and finish it and start something new. Because the only like you can't, I don't know. You you can't think your way into being better, and you can't think your mm-hmm. way into being happy with something. And you have to accept that you're never going to be happy with where you are. You're always going to be striving for something better because that's the point. I love it. I love that you always keep it real as well, and that's I think what makes you know it the best advice possible. It's real advice lived. Uh, and try tested and tried and true. So, Richard, I mean, we end things a little bit differently since the last time that you've been on the show. Uh, I always love. I, I've changed without telling you. Uh, so we always love asking what you're consuming outside of creating. So you know, outside of you know what you're working on, what are you watching? What are you reading? You know, what are you doing? Watching. Um, I just finished the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Um, I had actually I dipped out on that series at the end of season three because I didn't really love the uh, the idea that um, the saddest part of it was that she, as a an upper class white woman in the fifties, had outed a gay black man um, and turned it into like a, a bad thing that happened to her. But they really resolved that well and had her grow as a person and didn't make it easy. So fucking congratulations to the creators on that show because that they landed it well uh i just finished that yesterday and it genuinely made me cry um (laughs) uh reading wise uh i am i'm on like a real nostalgic kick at the moment i'm i i did um i did uh george's show short box summary a few months ago and read batman hush and then i've been listening to his show a lot and like he's got me so excited about like early 2000s marvel um so i've been like reacquiring a lot of books that i owned when i was a teenager oh that's so Um, awesome 
and I'm reading, uh, I have just read the script. I haven't seen the comic yet, but I just read the script for one of the stories for Minutes to Midnight, um, the uh, the Hour Between Life and Death, uh, the uh, Trevor Fernandez link heaven. Yeah, yeah, well, um, but which story? Um, uh, the, the, the one about the woman coming out of the mirror. Okay, um, I may, maybe I read that one, so. It, it's, uh, it's fantastic. Like people should be back in that campaign. Um, I think Trevor is a talent to watch. Uh, I think that he is really going places. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's, that's kind of it right now. Like I'm, there's, there's a bunch of like little things that I'm kind of getting to see before they come out, which I think I'm not allowed to talk about yet. Uh, Isn't that the um, best part? Cause you want to talk about it and it's like, I can't, yeah. but I want to. I, like it's so often people will be like having conversations and I'm like, I know where this is going. I know what's going to happen. And you guys like, and I just had to sit there and be like, I know the secret, you know? Um, I haven't read the secret, uh, but I say that I have, and I visualize that I have. And I think that, uh, is kind of the key. Come on. Yeah. That, that deserved a laugh. That's, that's something. <laughs> Look, these are all in my not funny enough for Twitter book. See, Stokes has this thing where he doesn't laugh at jokes, and I'm trying to I'm trying to embrace my Stokes here. Every time you made a joke, I'm just like I'm not giving it to you, Richard. Not on air. I'll laugh on the inside. <laughs> 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 no, that is awesome, Richard. I love it. We do have to wrap up though. An hour and twenty minutes into it, I was like, man, we got we got to do a hard cut off at forty five. But anytime we get chatting, dude, it's just it's so good. I can't break away. This is. This is good. <laughs> Let's remember, I have, I have, I am now the person who have, I've done an eight-hour interview. Like I, <laughs> so you are showing a lot of restraint. All right, so. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. Guys, once again, right there is the link to back this today. You get volume one at an outstanding price. Uh, while you hit up that early bird tier, you can't back it. We get it. Put this on Facebook. Put this on Twitter. Word of mouth is 100% for you. have nothing to lose. With that being said, it's time for us to wrap up. I hope you all have a lovely Tuesday. But most importantly, guys, keep it geekly.